100 professional athletes, an Olympic gold medalist gymnast, a world champion boxer, a major league baseball pitcher, and one pro climber. You thought Squid Games was fake? Nah, it's real, and it's called Netflix's Physical 100. So the whole premise of the show is there's 100 professional athletes and they're all competing to see who's the best, but not who's the best athlete, who's got the best physique. I know it's weird. So they each have this custom bust of them made, which if they lose their event, they have to smash. They should call this show Netflix's Body Dysmorphia 100. Every time somebody loses a challenge, the first thing they have to do is admit that they weren't good enough and that their body wasn't good enough. It's really their body that's at fault and smash their bust. They're basically just like, you see this right here? This is you. This is your body, you fat cow. You weren't good enough, now smash it. And you might be wondering, why would anyone go through this? Why would anyone sign up for this? Well, I haven't told you the prize yet. The prize for winning is 40 million won. So it's like $15. So the first event the competitors do right off the bat, they walk in, they gotta do the bar hang. So they pull out this giant metal chassis and they have all 100 competitors hang on it. And you can hang any way you want, you just can't use your legs. And whoever hangs the longest wins the first event. And you can tell these athletes, they really wanna prove themselves. They're trying their hardest. There's pain and suffering, grit. Everyone is desperately holding on, trying to be the last one hanging on the bar. And then we move over to the pro climber and he's just big chilling. So we're off to a pretty good start for our pro climber. You know, this event was tailor made for him. You know, everyone tries their best, but I mean, he's a fucking pro climber. He's obviously going to win this event and he does. He just kind of hangs out the whole time, pun intended, and wins the event. Nobody gets eliminated from this event. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to determine the order for the next event. In first place, our pro climber has the special privilege of getting to pick his opponent in the next event. And what is this next event, you might be asking? It's a one-on-one -on -one death match. The first quest with a 50% survival rate is the one-on-one -on -one death match. And at this point, some of the competitors are genuinely convinced that they're on Squid Games. It won't stop until someone drops dead. We could kill if he were asked to. It's really dangerous. The throat. Go for the throat. It's okay to kill. It's okay to kill. No, it's not. Now the way this deathmatch works is there's a three minute time limit where the competitors go one on one in an arena and have to fight until one of them is the last one standing with this big leather ball thing. And this is one of the things I like about every show not being made in America because all these American competition shows, they're so wholesome, they're so family friendly, you know, they never, they never take any risks. But the Koreans, they go hard. And two of the competitors that specifically caught my eye were these two professional female wrestlers. And one of them, you know, she picked a random opponent and obviously she dominated. There's really no way you're gonna win this event against a professional wrestler. But the other professional wrestler, you know, she didn't wanna fight another woman. She thought, you know, all the other fighters were gone. She didn't wanna pick on anybody. She didn't want an easy win. So she thought the best thing to do would be to fight a man. And I thought this was some badass shit. That's some, some warrior blooded instinct right there. But then she went on to pick this guy. I understand the concept that she didn't want to pick an easy target, she wanted a challenge for this event, but she didn't have to pick the biggest dude there. But in the end, it turned out that no amount of skill could really make up for a difference of 20 weight classes, so she ended up losing. And I really wish she would've just picked a guy that looks like me or something, you know, somebody she can just throw around. It would've looked cool, would've been respectful, badass, and she definitely would've won. But I know what you're thinking. What about the pro climber, right? How the hell is the pro climber gonna survive this? Pro climbers don't have any fighting skills, right? There's no fighting in rock climbing. That's where you're wrong. Rock climbing skills, if used correctly, can get you out of any situation. 
So they start fighting over the ball. Guy gets on top of him. What does our pro climber do? He'll hook to the face. So the guy thinks, okay, getting on top of him is not a good idea. What if I just try to pry the ball out of his hands? He's a rock climber. A ball is basically just a big sloper. You're not getting it out of his hands. So the guy thinks, okay, well, I'll just pick him up and slam him on the ground over and over again until he lets go of the ball. But this guy's never been bouldering before. You think those little slams are gonna do anything to a professional climber? Have you ever seen what happens on a bouldering wall? I got you. Oh my God. So just like in the previous challenge, our pro climber used his skills to get ahead and won the second challenge. And one of my favorite things about our professional climber going into all these challenges is he always chalks up. He's got to chalk up for every challenge, no matter what the challenge is, whether it requires chalk or not. And then, you know, that's the sign of a true climber, right? You got to chalk up for everything and you can't chalk up unless you have the right chalk bag. So this video sponsor is Zigzag and their Vessel Chalk Bag. This is a chalk bag made entirely from recycled bottles and fishing nets. So not only does this thing not contribute to pollution, but it actually reduces pollution. You're actually taking garbage out of the ocean to make these chalk bags. Pretty cool. And I already know what you're gonna say. I already have a chalk bag. I don't need a new one. But does your chalk bag do this? You can store all kinds of stuff in here. Snacks, money, first aid, even your cell phone. And I know some of you are gonna be like, why would I want extra weight in my chalk bag? That's gonna weigh me down. That's gonna make it harder for me to climb. Well, what do you send in silence? Oh, you are? Then just take it out. It's that easy. And now you got a normal chalk bag. Look at all these cool designs. They got multiple designs, cool color schemes. You know, they, they sent me three chalk bags. I don't know who needs three chalk bags. What the fuck am I gonna do with three chalk bags? I'm gonna send you one. If you order your Vessel chalk bag in the next week, you can win a free extra chalk bag signed by me. Who wouldn't want a chalk bag signed by a V6 climber? I know I would. So click the link in the description and use code climbing stuff to get 15% off your Vessel chalk bag. That's a lot, 15% off. And you could win an extra chalk bag signed by me. You have two chalk bags, be just like me. Have too many chalk bags, you won't know what to do with all of them. Check them out. Let's get back to the video. This challenge cuts the competition in half. Everyone who loses goes home, and now there's only 50 competitors left. And they're told to break up into 10 teams of five for the next challenge. And this is where things start to get a little petty. All these competitors keep talking about how similar the show is to Squid Games, yet they do the exact same thing that happens in Squid Games when they have to pick teams, and they refuse to put like any women on their teams. Like all the stronger guys are like, no, we don't want any, any women on this team. Like the Olympic gold medal winning gymnast gets booted off the team because he's not like buff enough. And this kind of goes into my next point, which is there were a lot of steroid allegations in this show, which there's probably a good amount of validity to. And it kind of seems like a lot of these guys only looked at the other guys that were massive and wanted them on their team. But uh, thankfully, it doesn't pay off for them in the end because just like the tug of war event in Squid Games, some of these stronger teams actually end up losing. The next challenge these competitors have to do has two parts to it. The first part is they have to build a bridge across this big gap. And the second part, they have to fill up these sandbags, run them up the stairs across the bridge that they built that falls apart pretty easily and dump the sand in this giant column and whoever has the most sand at the end of the time wins. And you remember that professional wrestler I told you about that absolutely dominated the ball challenge? Well, she ends up being the leader of one of the teams and she gets stuck with all the outcasts because like I said before, all these big strong dudes, they want other big strong dudes. They don't want women. They don't want the skinny guys, the gymnasts and stuff like that. So she ends up with this outcast team of misfits. And guess what? Just like in Squid Games, they win. But as good as their team was, they still weren't the best team because there was one team that reigned supreme above all other teams. And I call this the dream team, at the head of the dream team. We got the strongest leader, the smartest, the wisest, the MMA fighter. On sandbag duty, we got the fastest sandbag filler on this side of the Mississippi, tall white guy. And on bridge duty, the only guy you'd want building bridges the professional rock climber. So our pro climber finishes building his bridge just before the other team, giving them a nice head start. But the other team is still confident because they got much bigger, stronger dudes, and they're like, we can carry way more sand over, we'll catch up to them, and we'll pass them. But they forgot one thing. Sand is just a bunch of little boulders. So our pro climber continues on winning his third challenge in a row. And you might be wondering what happened to the 25 people who lost? Did they get eliminated? Not quite. They suffered a fate worse than death.
This was without a doubt the most nightmarish, disturbing part of this entire show. The 25 competitors who lost the last challenge all get one chance to redeem themselves by holding a rope that contains their bust on the other side, and the last five standing get to move on. And I can tell you right now, if they brought me in this room, I'd be like, just send me home. <laughs> like, just turn around, walk right back out. I don't want anything to do with whatever is going on in this room. So after the five winners of the nightmare room are chosen, we're down to our final 30 competitors, and they're told to split into three teams of 10 for the next challenge. This challenge requires the competitors to move a boat off of a dock onto sand, roll it across these logs on the sand onto a dry dock, which they have to pull it up all the way to the top of and anchor it. And things aren't looking particularly good for our pro climber at this point because he is not on the strongest team. Because just like the previous challenge, all the strongest competitors chose to be on the same team, leaving only one massive hulking man to be on the same team as our pro climber. But they also forgot one thing. These are team challenges and leadership is key. And at the head of the rock climbers team is the MMA fighter. So the first thing he does at the start of the event is delegate responsibilities based on the strengths and weaknesses of his team. And honestly, the biggest time save in all this is the pro climber gets put on rope duty. This would take a normal man over an hour, but a pro climber knows how to handle a rope. They also have this chest they have to smash open with a sledgehammer, and uh, the tall white dude gets put in charge of that, and he's like super proud of his uh, sledgehammer chest breaking abilities, and in fairness, he does do it really quickly. But it wasn't until I saw the other teams try this that I realized what he was talking about. And this was one of my favorite things about the show is I just loved how interesting the different challenges were. Like they weren't all just the same shit over and over again. Although it also brings up one of the most annoying things about this show is that it probably could have been five episodes because they just would repeat the same scene over and over again to fill in time. One, two, three. Ah, nice. Ah, nice. Ah, nice. I heard you the first time. I don't need to hear a guy grunt three times in a row to realize what's happening, all right? All right. So after all three teams try this event, the last place team gets eliminated, leaving us with the top 20. And this was probably my favorite part of the entire show. This was without a doubt the coolest section, the Greek mythology section. So this section's kind of weird. There's five different challenges. Each one's based on Greek mythology. They have to pick four people for each challenge and only the winner of each challenge will move on to make it into the top five. The first challenge is the punishment of Atlas. We have to hold like a 200 pound boulder over your head. The last one holding it wins. The second one is the punishment of Sisyphus, where you have to roll this boulder up and down a hill over and over again until nobody else can roll it up and down the hill. And you can tell our pro climbers are starting to sweat a little bit, right? Like, we don't move boulders, we just climb on them. But then they bring up the third event, the Wings of Icarus. This event requires the competitors to climb a rope that's continuously being fed downwards until there's only one more left on the rope. And our pro climber immediately picks this event, he's like, yes, thank God, let me do this one. But there's a problem. He's got a crossfitter on his team. And the crossfitter says, hey, I'm the best at climbing ropes. Let me do this one. You can go push a boulder up a hill. Can I do the rope? Thank God. You want to do the rope too? Yeah, I want to do it. I'm really good at climbing ropes. Oh, could you please let me do it? But thankfully the team kind of comes together and they're like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? He's a pro climber. Obviously, he's gonna do the climbing obstacle, and he's like, all right, fine, I'll do a different one. So first up is the punishment of Atlas, and this, this event blew my mind, because not only was I shocked that all these athletes were able to lift this boulder over their head in the first place, but the amount of time that they were able to do so was ridiculous. The final two competitors ended up holding the boulder for over an hour and a half before one of them had to drop it. These boulders weighed like 150 pounds. I can't even squat 150 pounds. The next event was the Fire of Prometheus. This was basically just an all out sprint. Who was the fastest? Who could get from point A to point B the fastest? And just looking at the four competitors who were chosen for this, I immediately thought the black dude had this in the bag. And I know you're probably like, why'd you think the black guy was gonna be the fastest? Because he looks the fastest. Look at their builds. We have a six foot eight MLB player, a massive bodybuilder, and a guy with, I'm sorry, kind of like a dad bod. And you know what? I was right. He's fast as shit. But even though he was fast, he actually wasn't the fastest. This was without a doubt the most surprising part of this entire show to me. The guy that I said had a dad bod before, apparently he's a professional ice loser and he is fast as fuck.
Now, in my defense, I didn't know what this guy did. I thought he was like a lifter or something. But the moment he jumped off that wooden platform and started sprinting, holy shit. Now for the event you've all been waiting for, the Wings of Icarus, the event chosen by our pro climber. At this point in the show, nobody has really said anything about this guy being a pro climber. Nobody's like mentioned it, acknowledged it. And even going into the rope climb, the other competitors don't even really see him as a threat. Like they all have a pretty good amount of confidence, but about 30 seconds into the event, their confidence drops to zero. This dude hangs on the rope like it's absolutely nothing. I mean, he's literally up there just hanging out, like just, just having a grand old time. He knows all the techniques. He's shaking out his arms and everyone's looking up at him, just freaking out. And at a certain point, the only other competitor left is this pro wrestler who's pretty confident he was gonna win this event. I'm confident I'll come in first. I picked it thinking I have an advantage. And if I climb with confidence, I think I can easily come in first place. But after a couple minutes of being on the ropes, he looks up at the pro climber and he's just like, fuck this, and he drops off. Oh, shoot. <laughs> so our pro climber wins his event, easily might I add, and makes it to the top five. And this is where things start to get really intense. There's only five competitors left, the winners of each Greek mythology event. What challenge would possibly be fitting for these final five competitors? a five-way tug of war. In a competition with 100 professional athletes, our pro climber made it to the top five. He used all his strengths. He used his hanging abilities. He used his heel hooks. He was the rope man. But at this point, he was out of tricks. There was nothing left for him to do. There's nothing a pro climber can do to help them in a five-way tug of war. It's kind of a super random event, and he was defeated. And as sad as it was to see him go, fifth place ain't too bad, you know? For 100 athletes, making it all the way to fifth place, you know, that says a lot for our climbing community. We're a lot stronger than people think. We can fight, we can hang on stuff, we can pull boats, we just can't play five-way tug of war. That, that's kind of the lesson I learned from all this. Now, the final obstacles in this were kind of disappointing. They kind of blow. They had like this panel flip challenge where they had to walk around and flip these panels to see who did it the slowest, who had the least of their color by the end. I, I don't understand who came up with this. It's not very interesting to watch. After that, they do like a relay race where I have to ring this bell over and over again. And uh, our ice luge buddy gets out on this one. And this brings us to the final challenge with the final two competitors, the rope pull. They have to pull this rope until the entire spool of rope is empty. It's a professional cyclist versus a crossfitter. Who can pull rope the best? Who's the best overall athlete? Who's the strongest across all different types of fitness? Who's the most cross fit? All right, I think this has gone on long enough. The CrossFitter wins. CrossFitter wins the whole thing, which is kind of cool. I gotta say, I'm not a huge fan of CrossFit. I know they may get made fun of a lot, but a CrossFitter winning a cross fitness challenge with 100 athletes from across all these different disciplines, it was kind of a cool ending. I mean, I think the pro climber should have won. I think he kind of got screwed on that <laughs> five-way tug of war. There's a lot of cool stuff that happens. There's a lot of stuff I didn't cover. It's a really cool show. Definitely check it out and get yourself a chalk bag. I'll see you guys in the next video.